Hello. Hey. Hello, so nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Hello, I cooked you some food. Hey, that's super nice. I'm hungry. Yes, I heard. Uh, I'm so excited to be talking to you about our books. Our books actually come out on the same day. Oh, that's wild. May 3rd. Uh, so, I heard you love Indian food. I do. Do you ever cook Indian food? Myself? No. <laughs> I'm impressed that you did. Eatown Eats the World comes out as the same day as how to prevent the next pandemic. So I figured I'd cook you some Indian food because I heard on the grapevine you love Indian food. Really, I do. I love Indian food as well. And I cooked you the recipes from Eatown Eats the World because I figured, you know, growing up, uh, my parents used food as a way to teach us about the world. And I thought since you love Indian food and how to prevent the next pandemic, I think at its core it is about caring about other people. And I figured it would be a little segue to just start by breaking bread together, which I feel like is the best way to uh, meet someone. I'd love to. Yes. Yeah, so I made you some paneer tikka masala. I made some homemade garlic naan, some paprika chaat. Uh, what's your favorite Indian food? Um, chicken tikka masala is probably at the top of the list. Oh, amazing. Yeah, that is, that is a delicious. Would you like some rice? Please. I have a question while we're eating together. What, do, do you cook often? Um, no, my cooking skills are very limited. You know, <laughs> if you give me a can of tomato soup, uh, I'll do okay. You know, I was, I was in our family, I was the one who did the dishes. Ah. Uh, so I'm quite good at the cleanup. I, I count That is respectable. People. Yeah. Should you do food from all over the world? Yes. I love food from around the world. And I think, you know, for me, what I love about food is you can really learn so, almost nearly everything you need to know about a civilization and a society from their food. You know, whether it's their surplus of food, their lack of food, the types of food they eat, how they get their food, where their food comes from. And, you know, both my parents growing up were educators and they really kind of used food as a way to teach us about the world. So yeah, so Eitan Eats the World uh, is my cookbook. And I love that our books were out the same day, but yeah, so I, um, these recipes are from Eitan Eats the World. And I, am really connected to your book, How to Print the Next Pandemic, um, because in March of 2020, my grandfather passed away from COVID. Oh, I'm sorry. And thank you. And I think, you know, I very much felt, you know, what it's like to lose someone from COVID. And, you know, at the time it was this kind of like mystery virus, you know, it was like the word social distancing was like, what is that? <laughs> uh, and you know, I think for me, the reason I also care so much about preventing the next pandemic is like he, like there was no resources. You know, one day I had a grandpa and then a few days later I didn't. The hospital, I had no idea what to do. And so I think I really resonate with that. And so I'd love to hear a little bit, you know, why is it so important that we do the research now? You know, cause I mean, I would gather like, you know, right now we can treat COVID patients, but you know, back two years ago, we couldn't. Yeah, the speed at which we got drugs uh, to help out took a lot longer than I expected. It's only now, two years in, that we have a couple of good drugs. The one thing that was faster than expected was the vaccine. That only took a year and historically that always took five years. So there, wow, uh, there was great science, great work. Mm -hmm. But we can take the lessons from this pandemic and say, okay, could we do the vaccines even quicker? And can we have libraries of drugs so that Mm -hmm. Even in that early stage, uh, when your grandfather got sick, you know, could we have for these big families of respiratory virus diseases, couldn't we have, have done it earlier? A lot of people warned the world, but it's a little different than earthquakes and fires where you're always being reminded there's a small earthquake. And so you think, oh, there's a small one, there could be a big one. Uh, there's a fire, a few houses burned down. Hey, once upon a time, cities would burn down. And so we're, we're really prepared. Whereas pandemics, the last gigantic one was a hundred years ago. So no, yeah. nobody remembers that. It's kind of in the history books and it's like, really? That's <laughs> that so happened. weird. You know, when you see the death spikes, you see World War I, and then you see an even bigger spike after World War I. That's the Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. Then you see World War II, and then fortunately nothing like that until recently. More Americans died in this pandemic than any war in history. Uh, and hey, for wars, we spend a lot of money. We do a lot of war games. Prepare. For, for fire, we have 300,000 uh, firefighters. And so we're clearly serious. I, I think this time 
you know, we'll get innovative scientists, we'll get, we need social scientists to tell us why it kind of drove us apart. Yeah. Uh, and how we didn't get uh, a consensus on some of those things. So, yeah, this year, while it's still fresh in people's mind, I think is a good time to have a proposal that, hey, let's debate what would preparedness look like. I think, you know, so many people want to go back to a new, like back to normal. Like you, you constantly heard that during the pandemic. Um, and I think, you know, for me, as someone who lost my grandpa to COVID, you know, I can't go back. Normal is my grandpa being alive. Like I, that's what normal is. Normal is, you know, driving to my grandma's and grandpa's house and my grandpa being there. Why is it so important that we don't go back to normal? Because I think that for me, as someone who lost someone to COVID, the thought of going back to normal uh, is not a positive one. Um, I feel like for me, you know, I'm like, no, we, we can't let this happen again. Yeah, the deficits that were created by the pandemic, you know, we should be very open about them. There's a lot of kids who for a couple of years didn't learn very much. Yeah. Uh, sadly, it's more the inner city schools or that happened as you get out to the suburbs of the private schools, that was less true. Uh, there's a lot of people whose mental health was affected. You know, I'm sure they enjoyed cooking, taking your recipes, uh, you know, that uh, was probably super nice that they could click and see your positive energy about uh, food. But we need to catch up on counseling. You know, we've seen even opioid deaths, sadly, are going back up again. And so the, the tragedy, you know, 20 million lives lost. Well, that's a statistic, but, you know, there are real people uh, for every one of those um, deaths. You know, my book's upbeat. I'm sure yours is upbeat yes, too. Yes, <laughs> mine is upbeat as well. You know, I think something that I love to hear is like, what surprised you the most in the research that you and your team did about preventing the next pandemic? Like, is there anything that people would be shocked to know? Well, the fact we could create a drug that would get your immune system on alert, and it wouldn't matter what the virus was, but that if you took it for like 90 days, your immune system would be told, hey, if you see anything, attack it like 10 times faster than normal. <laughs> uh, and that if we stockpile that, then no matter which uh, the virus comes up next, we can buy ourselves like 90 days by getting that out to people. On the negative side, I'd say that all these conspiracy theories, um, yeah. you know, some focused on me, some are just wild. The fact that they spread and really cause people not to use masks, cause some people not to take vaccines. You know, I'd sort of challenge, you know, the younger generation who understands the digital world and why sometimes the crazy stuff travels fast and the, oh, yeah. the sane stuff travels very slowly. Yeah. You know, what is it? How can you, particularly in an emergency, who are the trusted voices? You know, it's so great that the ideas about how you draw people in and make things exciting, uh, that in every format is, is cool, but let's apply that to good health advice, to good science, mm -hmm. and not have it be, okay, you sophisticated people, you all believe that, but you're just trying to fool the yeah. rest of us, some group that doesn't feel included or doesn't hear the voices that are their uh, trusted experts. Um, we had that some polio where in a country in Africa, Nigeria, they said it was to sterilize women, but the religious leaders would then visibly give their kids the vaccine and we, we managed to overcome that. I think something that was very strange was immediately after losing my grandfather, I, me and my family basically became like politicized, you know, especially being in the public eye. Um, you know, when I was, I was very vocal about it and open and immediately, you know, oh, you're being paid by the government. He didn't actually die. He never existed. Wow. Um, you know, I also had the for I was able to interview Dr. Fauci um, on my on my socials um, that also set off the, the crazies. Um, but it is, it was honestly one of the shocking parts for me during the pandemic was you know I didn't choose my grandfather to pass away from COVID, but you know I was instantly politicized, and you know just the fact that I even say the words my grandfather died of COVID gets people crazy. You know, education is so important. You know, throughout the pandemic, I really tried to kind of use my socials to encourage people to care. I feel like at the end of the day, you know, so many people, it's like, well, I'm not worried. I'm not gonna get sick. And I think at the end of the day, what's so important is like, care about other people. Like I, I like, I, you know, even like when mask mandates are lifted and stuff, like 
it, in areas of high transmission, you know, I'm not wearing a mask because a government's telling me to. It's because I, I mean, I've, I've had COVID before. I'm not personally terrified right now of getting it again, but I care about other people. Uh, one other question I have is like, what are you most proud about that you're working on? Um, I know the book's probably the answer. I'm also on a book tour right now. So everyone's like, hey, Todd, what's, what are you most proud about? And I always have my team behind the camera be like, you have to say that. <laughs> uh, which is true. I'm, you know, super lucky. I'm late in my career compared to you. Uh, you know, I <laughs> by a few years. I few years. did my software work. Um, now my foundation works my full time thing. I'm, you know, lucky to have three amazing kids. I'd say the the foundation and its ability to jump in, um, even when there's no profit to be made, to help mm -hmm. these poor countries. Um, we gave. Uh, two billion during the pandemic extra and one of them was a grant to an Indian company to duplicate the AstraZeneca vaccine mm -hmm. and so now they've made more than a billion. So there's these points of light. You know, we we tried some things that didn't work. We tried to fund therapeutics. Um, several of those didn't come through, but this one investment, uh, you know, justified all that spending that we did and, you know, it's gratifying. It makes me, you know, optimistic, um, and I, I think that, you know, your book is in an optimistic tone. I think, you know, obviously, pandemic is a scary topic. It's upsetting. Optimism and moving forward is is very important. And speaking of optimistic things, um, I thought we could do a little book swap. Oh wow! Um, cool. I, so even yeah. though you don't cook too often, for in case you ever do, um, there are lots of delicious recipes that taste the world. Um, the the like theme I would say is like comfort food from around the world. Oh, I, lo um, I love that. I, I know people who will cook for me, so I, I will take full advantage of your book. Uh, <laughs> your chef can cook from this. <laughs> uh, do you love tahini? I don't know tahini. Oh, well, you must try it. Uh, <laughs> Bill's chef, can we get some tahini coming up? I, I have another question about food while we're on it. Sure. What is the most nostalgic food? Um, you know, we always had Sunday night uh, roast beef dinners uh, at my house. My dad would carve and, uh, you know, that kind of brings back uh, those times. Mm -hmm. When I was sick, we'd always have uh, clam chowder, tomato soup. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, our clam chowder is different than other clam chowder. Oh, so you got to have the, our family recipe yes. uh, or else it just doesn't taste right. But yeah, a few of those growing up foods uh, bring back really great memories. Yeah, so shall we do a little book All right. swap? Uh, I am so excited um, to read this. I will be reading it on the plane. Both of our books hit shelves on May 3rd, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, I am excited to read your book, and I hope you're excited. To I'm excited to eat this food. I love ethnic food, and uh, you've got some of my favorites in here and some that I'm we looking can, forward to learning about. We can rename it Bill Eats the World. <laughs> Eitan Eats the World and Bill Eats the World. Uh, thank you so, so much. I am so honored to have been able to chat with you. Um, and I'm just continuing to be excited to follow all the amazing work you do. Fantastic. Thank you.